what I want to do today, we've got, you know, the the idea of this, the individual and the collective in women's liberation is try to sort of spell out a bit the relationship between the two and the importance of the two, because for socialists, I think, you know, we're very often denounced as people who only, who don't care about individualism, that, you know, people's individual wants and tastes and development are something that socialists are only concerned with the very, very um, collective way of, uh, of organizing society. And I think that in itself is, as I'm sure everybody here will be aware from their own personal experience, of course, isn't what socialism is meant to be about. Actually, socialism is about allowing for the development of the individual to the highest possible levels, the development which is denied to them under class society and particularly um, for our uh, purposes under cap capitalist society. So I think it's, you know, this idea that the individual doesn't matter or individual concerns don't matter, I think is something that firstly socialists shouldn't um, uh, accept. Secondly, of course, we're all individuals. We all have our own particular abilities, mm -hmm. lack of abilities, um, cultural backgrounds, all sorts of different things which make us the individuals that we are. But again, I think when we look at these, um, these questions of us as individuals, we also have to say that um, these are individual traits which are also greatly influenced and conditioned by the sort of social circumstances in which we find ourselves in the, in, um, the words of, uh, of Marx, men and women make history, but not in circumstances of their own choosing. And I think when you look at our own um, individual traits, then actually they're the product of a whole range of national, cultural, class, um, social elements, which make us the kind of individuals that we are. And Trotsky made this point very famously about Lenin um, I mean, they were the two great leaders of the Russian Revolution. He makes the point very famously about, about Trotsky in the, uh, sorry, Trotsky makes it about Lenin in the history of the Russian Revolution, which he wrote in the 1930s. And he's, he says really that if Lenin hadn't come back and argued for a particular way in which the revolution developed in, uh, in April, 1917, then the revolution probably wouldn't have happened and therefore Lenin as an individual was absolutely central. You couldn't just have replaced Lenin with some other person. But he also said this wasn't just because Lenin was a kind of superhuman individual. It was also because of the many, many years of experience he'd had organizing inside the Russian left, organizing for many, many years in exile. And that it was the two things together. The individuals were really empowered by the collective and it was his collective experience and understanding which also led him to be able to make a great impact as somebody individually so i want to try and look at some of these these kind of issues in in this talk today and one of the things that i want to do is to look particularly at how sexism women's oppression however we want to describe it impacts very very much and and probably for all of us impacts individually at least initially the way that we kind of experience it and the way that we uh, the way that we approach it um that's not to say it doesn't have a wider social form and wider social impact it certainly does but it's something where if you look at the way in which women experience uh sexism and also how they become at least initially aware of women's oppression is very much tied up, I think, with their individual experience, whether it's the experience of sort of feeling that as a woman you're undervalued, whether it's the experience of not being able to, as has happened, not so much for present generations, but for previous generations, women who weren't able to get an education because they were women, which was a very common thing up till about 30 or so years ago in, in, in this country. Um, whether it's because people have experienced direct sexual harassment or violence. And obviously this is a topic that's very, very much in our minds this week um, uh, after the, the awful murder of, of Sarah Everard. Um, you know, whatever it is, it tends to be expressed individually. And of course, much sexual, um, sexual harassment and so on is obviously carried out by individual men against individual women. So all of this puts it in a, um, 
in that kind of context. And I think it's important we recognize that these are things that actually do happen to individual women. And again, if you look back historically, it's very interesting. We look at Karl Marx's writing and Karl Marx wrote quite a lot of things about women, including he was working on some of the stuff that Engels then turned into the origin of the family at the time that he died in 1883. But when he was a very young man in 1846, he actually translated um, some writings by a, a French writer called Jacques Perchet, who um, had done a study of female suicides, women from what he called bourgeois families, from rich, um, upper middle class, probably families as we describe them today. And Marx went out of his way to translate some of this and to comment on these studies of suicide. And he did so because he pointed to three in particular um, where one woman committed suicide because she couldn't get an abortion and she'd become pregnant by her aunt's husband. Another one was um, somebody who was denounced by her family because she'd lost her virginity. Um, when she stayed at her fiance's house. And the third one was a woman who, whose husband was sort of uncontrollably jealous and who kept her in the house and who forced her to have sex with him. Now, in all these cases, these women committed suicide. And Marx was very clear to, obviously to show a lot of interest in this, but also to say that these individual questions obviously aren't just about the individuals. They're also about the wider social structures of society and the wider social attitudes of society. He returned to this in the late 1850s, was a famous divorce case in the aristocracy, uh, the Bulwer Lytton divorce case, where the husband and son of Lady Bulwer Lytton um, imprisoned her in an asylum. And it was a huge uh, uh, scandal, accused her of, um, of being mentally, mentally ill. And again, you wouldn't think this would be something Marx would be particularly interested in. But again, he saw this as the kind of prison that particularly the bourgeois family, the family of the rich, was for women in, in society. And he, he took the line then, he took the view then, that of course we want social revolution in order to, um, to change society, and we have to have social revolution in order to change society, but we are also going to have to change the structures of private life, that the way in which private life is organized, the role of women in the home, in marriage, in, um, the, in their sexual relationships will have to be totally changed and will have to be uprooted in order to, um, in order to fully change society. Now, I think it's very interesting that when people are talking about socialism like this, and he wasn't the only one, I mean, some of the utopian socialists talked about similar kind of questions, that they focus on these kind of things. And of course, it was something that although these issues are very often lost from public view or have been lost from public view when you look at them historically, it's also the case that when you um, look at certain times in history, they become very political indeed. And particularly, they're associated with what's sometimes called first wave and second wave feminism, where first wave feminism around the time of the suffragettes also saw women looking at all sorts of issues to do with contraception, to do with um, lesbianism, to do with the right not to get married and, and so on, the right to have financial independence. But perhaps more dramatically, what's called second wave feminism, which arose um, from the 1960s into the 1970s, was one which had a very important role in making many of these what were regarded as private questions, making them public questions, if you like, making them issues not just about relationships between men and women or, or fa within families, between parents and children, but these were questions which had, had much wider social significance. And this was true, um, this became true of abortion in the 1970s. It wasn't just a sort of private issue, it became an issue to do with class, to do with the ability of women to be able to control their own lives, true of contraception, true of divorce, true of domestic violence, which became again a political issue in the 1970s and you had the establishment of various women's aid centres and so on. The question of rape, again, these things had always existed and been reported in newspapers and so on, but it came, became an issue, not just about individual men raping individual women, but came an issue of how the courts treat uh, people who were raped, how 
why the society treats people who are raped, how the media treat it, all these sort of the questions, that the idea of women being pilloried because of the way they dressed or all these things, those became issues which were of importance in the uh, early 1970s. And the slogan, the personal is political, became one that, you know, people began to say, this isn't just about, you know, politics isn't just about economic issues. It's also about these personal issues. So that was a big advance, I think, in for second wave feminism was an important, um, important development. But of course, that approach to the personal is political has its limitations as well. And I think perhaps looking at it, what, 40, 50 years later, we can see many of the limitations that, that uh, are um, that it, it, it entails, because particularly, I, I think, through the development of identity politics, the idea that uh, your expression of your identity is a political question, um, it seems to me is a very, very, it's a very, very limited one. And also the whole uh, sort of paraphernalia of, of, uh, of the way in which identity politics are, are, are used. I mean, if you look, for example, at the idea of role models, and this is, you know, there has to be a woman that you kind of admire and identify with in order for you to fulfill your own uh, role as a woman. The idea of empowerment, um, the idea put by Sheryl Sandberg, uh, who was the um, director of um, Facebook about, you have to lean in. In other words, you have to kind of fit in to the, the whole sort of ethos of business in order for women to go up the ladder in, in that kind of way. If you look at those, actually what they're saying is, don't look at anything wider than the individual. It's all about the individual. The individual, if only they work hard enough, if only they present themselves in a positive way, if only they're prepared to compete on the same level as men, then actually they can get on. And I think that was a huge retreat from the collective politics of the um, of the 60s and 70s. It's an idea that which really says there's no collective answer to the problems of women. It has to be done as um, as an individual enterprise. And actually, if you're going to get on, the implication is, and the fact is, if you're going to get on, there's going to be 10 or 20 or 100 or 1,000 women who don't get on in the way that you do. And we see this. Um, we see this when you look at the structure of, um, of industry today, when you look at the structure of, of companies and employment, we see it in um, all sorts of areas of life that there's, there's these role models at the top of society, supposedly, while for the vast majority of women, I would argue things have got a lot worse if you look at generally in terms of work, in terms of um, pressure on women and, and so on and so forth. So I think what's important for us here is to actually look at the the you know the positive sides of this but also to look at the um at what the limitations on individual uh change are and um you know i think one of the important things for us to understand is these individual statements and protests are important they you know they're important in, in terms of people standing up and saying we're not going to accept what has been decided for us for years and years, but they can only take you so far. And what they can do is highlight what is wrong, but they can't point a direction out of those individual problems towards a solution which will benefit the whole of, um, the whole of society. And I mean, my argument would be that it's, it's only the collective struggle and the collective organization which can actually overcome the contradiction between the individual and the collective it's only the collective which can actually lead to a transformation of society which then allows the ability of all of us to develop ourselves to our full potential individually whatever that uh, we think that full potential is and i suppose the way i would perhaps perhaps sort of compare it is that Trotsky, again, to go back to Trotsky, who wrote a lot of very interesting things on these sorts of questions about um, the individual and the collective. When he, he, Trotsky was very, as many of you will know, I'm sure, was very, very keen on literature. And he's, in fact, he said that his 
the two great loves of his life were politics and literature. And when Leo Tolstoy, who was one of the, well, I suppose, the greatest 19th century novelist in, in Russia died. Trotsky wrote a little um, obituary of him. And what he says is, is very interesting because he says that Tolstoy, in a way, was kind of backward looking. He didn't like industrialized Russia. He didn't like the liberal um, values of industrialized Russia, which he said were destroying the old Russian values as, as he saw it. And he kind of was slightly backward looking in that way. But the, the point that Trotsky makes, and he makes it very forcefully, he said, and I'll, I'll just quote it actually, because it's a very good point. He said, Tolstoy did not know or show the way out of the hell of bourgeois culture. In other words, he, he couldn't, you know, he couldn't point a way forward. His only way forward out of capitalist development in Russia was to go backwards, was to idealize the peasantry and to go backwards in time. But he says, but with irresistible force, he posed the question that only scientific socialism um, can answer. So in other words, he posed what was wrong with society without being able to give an answer to those problems. But he pointed that what he did in, in highlighting those problems was actually to point to what only socialism could really answer, which was a collective change, which would, which would take people forward uh, rather, than, uh, rather than backward. So I think, that for us is a central is a central question when we're looking at these uh, at these sorts of issues, and of course that brings us to the question here about when we talk about socialism, when we talk about socialist change, we talk about it in terms of in very much in terms of class about how individuals, as I said earlier, are empowered by the collective, but it's the collective class organisation which we see in revolution, we see it in major trade union struggles, we see it in major political struggles that, that take place. It's only um, those which can really take, can really provide the answer to the questions that are posed by those who fight against women's oppression and those who fight over, um, uh, over sexism and all those sorts of things. And I think that's very, very important for, under, for us to understand. And I think it's in contrast to two major and quite powerful currents which exist on the left and which I think both don't succeed in doing this for different ways. Um, one is that the whole question of women's oppression becomes a completely subjective one. Now we've talked about it as the individual, but we've also got to look at the way in which this is also an objective reality which exists for billions of women around the world. Their oppression is not a figment of their imagination. It's just, it's not just about how they feel, it is a material reality based on, you know, whole centuries and centuries of um, millennia of, of women's oppression that have been that have been going on. It's a material reality for women, which it, which is expressed in terms of a whole range of things to do with domestic labor and social reproduction to do with lower wages and conditions at work to do with the threat of violence and sexual attack to do to do with all of these things and you cannot just subjectivize it in this way you've got to look at how it exists as a system as part of the capitalist system and so i think there's a real danger of sort of subjectivizing this and just looking at it in terms of identity or just looking at it in terms of privilege theory, because I don't think these things really explain anything about why we are where we are or how we've got to uh, or how we've got to where we are. So that's the first thing I think when we talk about the individual and the collective that we should reject this idea of just looking at it in terms of subjective identity, subjective ideas of privilege. And I, I've, I've always thought that kind of dividing the oppressed up in terms of relative privilege is not the most useful way to start campaigning or organizing about how to end um, oppression in this kind of way. The second thing, the second um, uh, current I would, I would say, and again, it's very widespread and it takes many different forms, is the idea that there exists a kind of patriarchy which overlays capitalism. And I think that the, the problem with that theory is that it leads to a kind of idea of eternal oppression, that we're always going to be oppressed and there's nothing that you can ever do uh, to change it. And it seems to me that, you know, we, we should say, 
when we're talking about socialism and, and class politics, we go beyond both of those. And we talk about the way in which, um, in which the collective organization of women alongside men, women and men of all races and nationalities, backgrounds based on, not on their particular identity, but on the, the question of whether they are or are not exploited inside capitalist society. And the vast majority of those obviously are exploited within capitalist society. I mean, the vast majority of um, the oppressed are also within the working class is the, um, is the truth of this situation. We have to go beyond the other theories and say this is, you know, we have to see the overthrow of capitalist society as being the precondition for the development of equal, equal rights and end to, or beginning of the end to the kind of oppression that we, we see that, we, that so divides us under capitalist society. And um, as I said earlier, the development of all of us individually, the ability of all of us, not just to have to be subject to the miseries of exploitation and of, of work and all the other things we do, but where our work and our, our leisure lives become part of our own human development and we all develop individually as part of that wider collective change. So I'll, I'll leave it there. And obviously there's a lot I haven't talked about, but I hope we can, um, we can discuss it from there.